Jacob, if you want to have youth, that, that'll be good up there. So if you want to do that, you can have youth. But there will be no church on Wednesday night for adults. So uh, what you do on that day is you just stay home and relax and enjoy it. Amen. All right, y'all. Y'all's quiet this morning. All right. Tonight, 5 o'clock, Chiefs in Logan. We are going to have our Valentine's dinner. So if you want to be a part of that, you can just meet us at Chiefs at 5 o'clock. And then after that, everybody can go home and turn on their TVs and start cheering for the Rams. <laughs> I, I'm like amazed that like all these people have been ashamed of the Bengals for years, never would wear a hat, never would wear a jersey, and then all of a sudden, one year, the sun shines and Blind Chicken finds some corn, and there's like everybody wearing orange and black going, who day? Jamar Chase has always been my favorite receiver. People, he's only been in the league two years. <laughs> Joe Burrow's always been my hero. He's only been in the league two years. So all you bandwagon fans go back to whoever you like that didn't make the playoffs, Dolphins, Dolphins. But uh, go Rams. Stafford. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, we're going to be spiritual. Let's go to the Lord and worship. We're going to worship in our giving. We're going to turn this praise team loose. And let's just have an amazing day in the house of the Lord. Don't forget, uh, at the end of service, we're going to partake in communion. And I want to give a communion disclaimer. It's cran grape. <laughs> it's uh, the Dollar General... Nobody's got orange juice. Nobody's got grape juice. Uh, if you, I'm going to have to like start stocking up grape juice just so we can have it. In, but uh, we, we, we're using cran grape this morning. But, uh, but we are going to have communion this morning uh, after service. And today we're just going to be talking about the love of God. Amen. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we have this opportunity to be in your house. And God, today we just, I thank you for your love. God, I thank you that while we were yet sinners, you still loved us. God, I thank you that no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. So today as we enter into this place, as we enter into worship, God, we're going to allow all the, the obstacles, all the things that are going on in our life right now, we're just going to tune those out and we're just going to begin to focus on you. And the theme of today is, God, your love. You are love. So God, as we Enter into your presence, God. Again, we're just thankful that we have this opportunity to be in your house. We're thankful that we had the opportunity to give this morning. And we're just asking you to bless the offering. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Stand and worship with this praise team. i 
Jesus. He is worthy of all the praise, all the honor, all the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Lord, we worship you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Close. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love.
Get ready to go back into that bridge as our children are quietly dismissed to go with Miss Shelley. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kill. to love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life one more time for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life Jack would you bless the word Father we thank you today for another opportunity. Lord, this day is about love, and there is no greater love than the love that you show to us. Lord, we give you everything today. Lord, let us set aside every worry, everything we came in here with, and Lord, let us dedicate this day to worship and to love on you, our King and our Redeemer. Lord, let us bless the blesser today. Lord, you've given us so much, and we could never repay you, but just your life on Calvary, Lord, that we can have eternal salvation. 
Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And we ask God right now that you bless our pastor as he brings the word. God, let it be used to change lives and change hearts. And if there's one here today that don't know that love that you bestow upon your people, let this be the day. What greater day than the day we were celebrating Valentine's Day for someone to give their life unto you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I just want to start out this morning and say, God loves you. Some of you need to hear that again. God loves you. Now, I've heard that my entire life, and I understand Chipper, when I say that, it's easy for me to say that God loves you. God loves you, Danny. God loves you, Nate. But it's hard for me to understand that God could really love me. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I can see how God loves the world. I can see how God loves you, but when it comes to me, I know how bad I am. I know how insignificant I feel at times. And to say God loves me is hard. To know things that I've done, know things that I've said, know the people that I've hurt, and just so on and so forth. It's hard for me to understand how God loves me. So when I understand that God could love you, it's still hard for me to understand that God could love me. Today, I want to talk about one of the attributes of God, and I want to talk about his unconditional love for each of us. It's Valentine's Day, and he wants to be your Valentine tomorrow. So I've heard my whole life, God loves you. We've sung it, Jesus loves the little children. We, 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 we've sung all these little songs in Sunday school, and I believe with all my heart that God loves you. But it's often hard to apply his love toward me. Again, because, Danny, I know how insignificant. Nate, I know how unworthy at times I feel. And I want to ask two questions. And, and, and maybe you can relate to these when I ask these questions. But, you know, why would God love someone as bad as me? People ask that all the time. Why would God love me, somebody as bad as me? You know, the, all the things that I've done wrong... All the, 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 the crazy things, all the crazy thoughts that have went through my mind. I, I know all the people that I've hurt. Why would God love me? Why would lo God love somebody as bad as me? How could God love somebody that has done so many terrible things? And I'm curious, how many of you would say, I often feel unworthy? How many of y'all would say, I often feel undeserving the, of the, the love of God? Well, you should. Because we don't deserve it, we're not worthy of it, but for God so loved the world. He just gave it. He just gave love. And in fact, when you look through scriptures, you can see people in the Bible who are a lot like us, and they cannot understand the, the attribute of, uh, of God's love. You look at Job. Job really saw God at his purest because in Job chapter 42, verse 5 through 6, he said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, he says, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. I retract. Now that I've seen you, now that I really, I retract. Think about that. Job saw himself as unworthy. Job, he saw God and he says, now I just kind of, I don't feel worthy. I'm undeserving of this love. Paul, who I believe was the greatest apostle of them all, began to reflect on all the bad things that he had done. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 
The greatest apostle to ever walk the face of this planet said, I feel unworthy to even be classified as an apostle. I can't, I'm undeserving of the love of God. I'm, un, I'm unworthy of the love of God. You can almost hear when Paul reads that or quotes that scripture and says that, that he, you can, you can uh, kind of feel his insecurity because he goes all the way back through his life and he realizes, look at all the things that I have done. And it's not just the bad things that I have done to, to certain people, but he said, I have persecuted the church of God, and yet he still loves me. So why would God love somebody as bad as me? Another question is, is why would God love somebody so insignificant? There are a lot of people in this world, and all this world and its problems, and in the whole scheme of things, what would God why would he even take the time out to love insignificant me? In fact, when you read the Old Testament, Moses, he had these same, these same feelings. He had these, these same feelings of insignificance. When God was going to raise Moses up to deliver the Israelites, Patty, what did he, I mean, he said, Moses, here's your job. And what does Moses say? Who am I? Who am I? Why in the world would you call me all these people on the face of earth and you're going to call me? Moses said, who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm not good enough. He said, I'm insignificant. Who am I that I should be the one to go to Pharaoh and bring your people out of Egypt? Who am I? Anybody ever say that? David said the, the very exact same thing whenever God had... Uh, got the people together and began to worship, and, and he was uh, going to worship God and give God, God the, the temple and stuff. And in 1 Chronicles 29, 14, he says, But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Who are we? I mean, everything we have is from him. So who am I? We're bad, we're insignificant. God, how could you love somebody like me? Kalina's asking that same question. But how could you love somebody like me? And I think we need to understand the next statement because it's very important. God doesn't just love you. God is love. So he doesn't just love you, he is love. And love is not just something that God does, it's love is who God is. God is love. And, and scripture says, the one, in 1 John 4 and 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Not an attribute of God is love, no, God is love. That's who he is. He has no other uh, uh, emotion about him when it comes to that. It's, he's love. Now, this is how God showed love among us. You want to know how he showed it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave. You didn't deserve it. You weren't special. He loved you enough that he gave. And Love is not just what he does, it's who he is. And when we recognize that it's not just an action of what God does, Nate, but it's a reflection of who he is, that changes the whole aspect about love when it comes to God. See, I love Danny based on circumstances. Let's be honest. I love you, Nate, based on circumstances. If we're good, I love you. If we bad, stay away from me. Not you, all right. But here's the thing. Because, it, because love is who he is, there's nothing that I can do, Nate. There's nothing more that I can do, Danny, to gain more love. He just loves me. Before... I even knew anything about this world. He loved me. 
get while I was still a sinner. Christ loved me, and he died for me. No greater love than a man lay down his life for friends. There's nothing I can do that will stop him from loving me. I don't care what you've done in your life. There is nothing that you have done in this life that is going to stop God from loving you. Well, Pastor, you don't know. I don't care. Now, church people may say, well, but God is love, and there's nowhere that you've been in this world and in this life that God's going to remove his love from you. <coughs> the next time you feel unworthy, the next time you feel undeserving, remember this. God's love covers your sins. God's love, Jesus shed his blood for the covering of our sins. 1 Peter 4 and 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. God's love covers your sin. And this is so important because I did a lot of wrong stuff. Growing up, I felt so unworthy of God's love. So I thought, man, I got to work harder. I got to stop doing bad stuff all the time. I got to start being religious. And the more I tried to be religious, the more I seemed to do bad things. You want to know why? It wasn't until I was probably 19 or 20 years old that, and I was lost in the middle of more sin than you could ever imagine that I realized that God truly loved me through Christ and that I could be made right with him. I didn't understand that. I was never really told about the love of God. I was just told all the stuff I couldn't do. Can't go bowling, you can't go fishing, you can't go here, you can't go there, can't do this, don't wear that, don't do this, don't, 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 don't. Can I do anything? Church, it's not by works. It's not by works, but by the love of God, by His grace and through His mercy. You see, I was hard trying. It was, it was hard going to church. Like, you had a bunch of rules. Oh, you got saved tonight? Re memorize all these rules of the scroll of the church of God. And tradition of men. And if you don't know them by next Sunday, don't come back until you do because we need perfect people here. Oh boy, I'm gonna get trouble. That's like out there, isn't it? You see what the checklist what the checklist done was condemned people. What the checklist did was run people from the church. People never thought they could be saved because I can't live by man's rules. Oh, I had to realize one day, Danny, I was born again. I mean, literally, I had, to, I had to come to the conclusion, I am born again from God, not a list of rules, not a list of do's and don'ts. I was new. I was born spiritually, and, and something spiritually began to burst through my life. I realized the old nature was gone. I, didn't, I mean, I realized God loved me. Everything became new. I, I, I was a different person. I, for the first time, when I was 19, 20 years old, and, and I know that God showed me his love and his mercy and his grace before then. I don't want anybody, I mean, but for the first time in my life, around 19 years old, I felt truly the love of God. I'll never forget when I gave my life to, God, to Christ. I mean, I had years of frustration and hate how could a God take my dad from me how could a God be so mean to my family how could God do all the I'd curse God for years I'd sneak out my window at nine o'clock in the morning just so mom and make mom be late for church because she'd be trying to find me to make me go to church I'm not going I'd lock my door she couldn't get in she'd sit there and beat the door I, I thought man I'm gonna get killed later I didn't want nothing to do with God. But at 19 years old, for the first time in my life, I felt it poured all over me. I'll never forget that experience because God's love covers sin. 
That's what makes his love so beautiful. His love, his love covers sin. And when we realize that, I, I, I love the way it's phrased in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. A lot of people need to catch this next line. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Spirit. When the love of God appears, it covers sin. Period. You don't need to give people a book or a scroll of rules of do's and don'ts. Let them realize God loves them. The second thing is this. When you start to feel insignificant, remember, God's love makes you significant. It's his love that makes you who he wants you to be. You're never going to be significant on your own when it comes to God because Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you with loving kindness. Everlasting love, church, that's what he's talking about. Everlasting love. He said, I have drawn you with loving kindness. God is drawing some of you this morning with loving kindness. You may say, but there's so many of us. How could God care about me? I feel so insignificant. Let me tell you three quick stories in the, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and I want you to understand what one means to God. Once there was a story of this woman. She had ten coins. Y'all remember that story? The parable? She had ten coins, and she lost one of the coins, and she was so upset. The Bible said she ripped her house upside down looking for one coin. The basis of that story is God will rip the house upside down looking for that one. There was another story of a father who had two sons and one had taken his inheritance and went and squandered it and was eating with the pigs. Now, here's what is amazing to me, and church people need to understand this. Yes, he had another son, Chipper, and he could have been content and said, well, I've got a good son and I'll just let the bad one go. No, here's what happened. Every single day, the dad would go to the end of the gate, to the end of the property, and he would say, maybe, just maybe, today is the day that the one comes home. The one. Now, how many remembers the story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep? And the Bible says that one day one wandered off, and even still yet, he had 99. He had 99 church people. But he said, 99's not enough because one has wandered away. And I'm going to go find the one. So yes, even though there are over 6 billion people in the world, yes, even though right now you all are all in this room and people are online hearing this very same message at this very same moment, do you realize there still may just be one today? We saw it a couple weeks ago in this building. God wrecked the whole thing and said, forget about what you've got planned. I've got this whole moment set up for one person and I'm going to change their life. I fought with God for all night long and all morning long and he changed my sermon and I didn't like it. For one, you used to walk with God but you walked away. His loving kindness is drawing you back this morning. You who ended up divorced and you feel the shame and the guilt and the remorse over this and over that. You feel unworthy. God's loving kindness is drawing you back this morning. Some of you, you've never really been able to be a part of a church because of things that have happened in the past. God is, His loving kindness is drawing towards you today. His love. That's what it's all about. This is his loving kindness pulling him to himself. You have, uh, we have uh, addictions that we, a lot of times we feel so dirty and unworthy. God doesn't just love you. God is loving you right now. The world may say, give up on them. They're this and they're that and they're, they're bad. And God's saying, no, I love them. They're one. 
Some of you, you're like, man, I don't even know about all this God stuff. Well, something's going to happen right now. His loving kindness is drawing you. God is love. Wait, up, won't you come on to the piano? land different than I thought. For God so loved the world, Nate. Not the good. He never said, for God so loved the good. In fact, Jesus said, nobody's good. Just the Father. He said, for God so loved the world. Some of you right now, all of us right now, we need to, we need to take the word world out and put your name there. For me, for God so loved me, for God so loved Pastor Mick, for God so loved Miss Patty, for God so loved Danny Napper, for God so loved Chris, for God so loved Nate, for God so loved Ellis, for God so loved Jacob, even Trina. It's all because love is not just something that God does. Jacob, it's who he is. It's who he is. One of the things that really, really, really helped me understand God's love is having more than one child. I, before, I never understood how you could have a, two kids and like, I love them both the same. How could I possibly love another child the way that I love Isaiah? When we had, you know, when we had Isaiah, I was so overwhelmed with this. He scared me when he first came out, though. He was blue and looked like a lizard and had a cone head. And I thought, man, I guess I got to love this thing. But when he was born, you just hold him and you're like, it hurts so much that I love this way. I, and I don't even know you yet, but I love you. And I remember thinking, how could I possibly love another child as much as I love Isaiah? And then God gave us Riley. And Isaiah, you better be glad you were first. such a different kid we're all different but Riley was born and she had the most beautiful dark black hair and even to this day nobody gives better hugs than Riley and suddenly I realized I could love two children equally intense but yet they both are so different both are different individuals but yet I love them both the same yeah sometimes I feel bad about myself Nate. sometimes I feel insignificant but being a father and loving children I can see how God can love you and God can love me in the very same personal way. And that's why we love each other. When we love each other, do you all realize we're loving Him back? Why? Because He first loved us. See, when God tells you He loves you, not something he does it's who he is God right now God this sermon's hitting somebody very hard right now I feel it in my spirit you are really tugging at hearts there are people that need to feel the love of Christ in this room 
They need to know that you love them regardless. So we ask in this moment, God, that you would just fill this room and overwhelm us. God, let us, bec- let us become overcome with unconditional love in this room right now. I know there's some of you right now in this room, you feel unworthy. You feel undeserving. And you may even feel insignificant. But your prayer right now needs to be, God, let me know you in a more intimate way. God, I just want to know your love. God, I want to know the power and the truth of your love and your grace and your mercy. God, show me. Let me feel that unconditional love right now in this moment. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I really do. I I, I battle with feelings of insignificance. I don't feel good enough. But you say, I want to know God more. I want to know Him more intimate today. If that's you, would you raise your hands? Nobody looking around. If that's you right now, would you just lift your hand? I see hands going up in this room. Pastor, you just don't know what all I've done. How can God love me? Who He is. That's who He is. we all just stand and lift our hands to heaven right now we just raise our hands and begin to ask God to to shower us with his love grace his mercy God I pray right now that as the body of Christ as we hear your word this morning as we worship in this place God as we serve in our community as we reach those who don't know you. God, can your love be so real that we can't miss it? God, I pray right now that we would be overwhelmed and that we would be different, God, because we understand that as believers in Christ, we're living from the position of acceptance, not because of works, not because of our actions, but because of the love of God that He has shown us through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And God, right now, out of that place of strength, out of that place of acceptance, may we live in such a way that we reflect Your love to the world. God, not based on skin color, not based on social status, not based on how much money's in the wallet, but God, we love because you first loved us. There's some of you right now, you're the one. You're the one. You're the lost coin. You're the lost son. You're the lost sheep. You're here because God's love is drawing you. God's love is working on you right here, right now, in this moment. My Lord, I feel this. Church, pray. You're the one. You are the one. Thank you.